Welcome to today's talk by Joss Saunders, <coughs> General Counsel of Oxfam, on the theme of advancing education globally. Before Tom Cartwright introduces Joss, I wanted to take a moment to set this event in the context of our London office's contribution to pro bono and community service. In recent years, pro bono and community service have become a hallmark of our office here in London. We have more than doubled the number of hours of pro bono legal services that we provide to charities and individuals in need. And we have built strong relationships in the community. I am particularly glad that we can build upon this momentum by hosting today's launch event for the firm's Community Impact Week 2016. Our theme for this year's week is supporting education and firm-wide will be involved in over 150 events across the globe. Tom? Hi. I'm delighted we can be joined today by Josh Saunders, General Counselor of Oxfam UK. Um, as many of you will know, Oxfam is one of the world's leading humanitarian aid organisations um, operating across over 90 countries around the world, um, looking to find solutions to poverty and poverty-related injustice. Aside from his busy day, day job, Joss's passion is mobilising the legal profession in the fight against poverty. Um, just over 10 years ago, after the Southeast Asian tsunami, Joss sent an email round the partners of pretty much every law firm in London asking us to get together for a meeting to discuss what we could do in the, um, in the fight against poverty and in the immediate aftermath of that massive tragedy. And there are a number of questions asked us, you know, what can we do as lawyers? And Joss's response was, was very straightforward. We are in exactly the right place and exactly the right profession to fight poverty. And on that note, I would like to pass on to Joss. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks, Tom, for the introduction, and William. Um, so as Tom said, I'm the general counsel at Oxfam. Oxfam works, as Tom says, in 90 countries of the world. It probably does three things it's best known for. The emergencies work, which is responding to natural disasters like uh, a Nepal earthquake or to conflicts such as Syria or Yemen. So that's the emergency end of it, and that's the stuff that you see on your television screens. The bit that you don't see so much of is the long-term development work and the advocacy, and that's really where the focus on education comes in. And I think education is important for three reasons. First is education is a good in its own right. It's good for the people who do it. The second is education is a gateway to other things for those people. And the third one, and the one we mustn't forget, is that education isn't just a gateway for the people who, who get the benefit of the education, it's great for the whole of society. You may have heard of the Nobel Prize winning uh, economist Amartya Sen. Uh, he got his Nobel Prize mainly for his work on poverty in India. And what he did is he mapped in every state in India the number of girls in primary education. And he reviewed it every five years. And what he noticed is that the poorest state in India at the beginning, Kerala, over the course of 25 years, increased the proportion of girls in primary education. And as that went up, every five years, looking at all the statistics about the economic well-being of Kerala as a whole, Kerala improved. And so there was a direct correlation between education and primary school education for girls and a growth in the whole economy. So education really, really matters. Um, in terms of being general counsel, uh, covering 90 countries, I've got at my disposal, including me, five full-time lawyers, uh, two part-time lawyers, two paralegals, and one trainee who's given to us by a law firm. So that actually makes it an impossible job. Uh, you can't do 90 countries with that number of lawyers, unless you get lots of other people to help, and that's where you come in. Unless you get volunteers and you get lawyers other people, paralegals, communications people, everybody mobilised behind a cause. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a, another meeting. And what I always like to do is get practising lawyers together with law students. We had a meeting in Oxford and we had some practising lawyers 
solicitors, barristers, and we had some law students. And one of the law students was a girl called Rachel. And I was quite impressed because she was carrying a really big, heavy legal textbook. In fact, one of the heaviest, probably land law, you know, one of the heaviest textbooks you, you could imagine. And uh, she said, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm a bit late and I'm a bit tired, but I've been revising for my exams. And I was in the library till four o'clock in the morning. And I thought, is that what students do at four o'clock in the morning? <laughs> uh, but, but then I thought, then I thought, hang on a minute. She said she was in the library at four o'clock in the morning. That means the library's open at four o'clock in the morning? And that got me thinking about my education and about libraries. Uh, and so I thought I'd show you some pictures. And the first one, by the way, this is, this is Mary. She, we'll call her Mary. I, I'll anonymize all, all the names in here, um, just in case, you know, it's sort of data protection, all that sort of stuff. Um, but Mary's this lovely little girl in Kenya. And she found this wig, and it's just great, lovely, my favorite picture. Uh, this is my university library. Some of you may recognize it. It actually goes on underground, and there's, um, there's over 11 million printed items in this library. Um, there's 80,000 electronic journals in this library. And this is the law section of the library. It's got half a million books for the students, law books. Now, Rachel is actually from another university in Oxford, and I, I talked to her the other day, and she said that her library's got about 400,000 books, so not quite as many, but it's also got access to the same 80,000 electronic journals. So quite a lot of access to quite a lot of materials. Now, I'd like to contrast that with another library. So last night, I was at our, uh, my church group with a friend called Kathy, and Kathy had just been out to Democratic Republic of Congo, which is that enormous country in the central Af uh, center of Africa. And the region she'd been to was Ituri. And Ituri has been in the news a lot over the last 20 years because there's been a very long-running conflict and several million people have died. And they're trying to set up universities there. And Kathy visited one particular university in a town called Bunya. Now, there's actually three universities in Bunya, and this is the smallest. And I'd like to show you a, a picture of their library compared with this one. This is the library of the university. In fact, it's the library of one of the faculties. They don't yet have a law faculty. And, and Kathy actually didn't go and count every single one, but she kind of did an estimation. And she worked out that in this library, for this faculty, in this university, in Central Africa, there are about 4,000 books. And then she went to the librarian and she said, can you tell me how many of these books were published since the year 2000? 15. Mm. 15 books for that university faculty published since the year 2000. Now, it's a bit unfair, isn't it, to compare apples and pears. I mean, universities in kind of leading centers of knowledge, like Oxford, we've got 32,000 students in Oxford, that's one in five of the population. We've got uh, leaders in virtually every field, it's a, a big research university. Bunya serves a very different purpose and a very different population. And the three universities together are really trying very, very hard to help all the people in that province. And that province, Oriental province, has got eight million people in it. There's an absolute shortage of doctors, there's an absolute shortage of engineers, and there's an absolute shortage of, guess what, lawyers. So it got me thinking about the differences between our educational system and the educational system in other countries. And one of the main things for me about lawyers in poverty is what can we as lawyers do to help with education in other countries? So I'd like to um, share with you two different experiences of education. We could start off with Tom, we could start off with William, we could start off with any of you, but if you just take my own education as an example. So in common with most people in this country, I did 13 years at school. I then went on and did three years at university, and then I did two years at law school, and a bit later on I did another master's. Now, my maths isn't too good, but that adds up to getting on for 20 years in full-time education. That's quite an investment. And my guess is that most of you have been the beneficiaries of about 20 years of full-time education. Now, let me take you back a few years to give another example, because when I left university, instead of becoming a lawyer straight away, I went and I became a teacher in Uganda. And this, oh, 
Sorry. I'll just tell you about this one first. So, sorry, I'll go back to the, uh, go back to Uganda in a moment. Um, so when you compare the differences between educational systems in different countries, then I look for metaphors to kind of explain why is it that's so different? Why is it that we've got so much here and other people haven't got so much there? And there's lots of different metaphors you could use. I like the metaphor of a seesaw. Uh, you know, you, you have two children in the playground and maybe one of them's a bit bigger than the other <laughs> and it kind of goes down a bit. And the poor child, which was usually me, <laughs> up there was trying to get back to the ground. And it just seemed unfair. But, but being British, uh, I like the metaphor of sport and, and soccer or of, uh, of cricket. So, so the metaphor for me for this is the level playing field. And, and here's two unlevel playing fields. This is actually in the Olympic Park in, in Germany. It's actually an artwork rather than a real uh, football pitch. Uh, you'll be pleased to hear. But it shows that if you're playing uphill or you're not playing on the level playing field, it's not that easy. And the example from cricket is this one. So how do you play cricket? How do you do anything? How do you get educated if it's not on a level playing field? And so that brings me back to Uganda, sorry. Um, so this is a picture of um, our school bus from my school that I went to teach in when I left university uh, in a town called Kabali in southwest Uganda. It's down on the border between uh, Rwanda and Congo. And it was quite a big school, and in fact, it was partly a boarding school because some of the children had to come very, very long distances and they wouldn't have been able to come every day. So boarding school with some day pupils, and, and this is the school transport. Now, kids everywhere are amazing. You've all been kids, you all know kids, they are fantastic, and wherever you put them in any kind of educational setting, they're going to have a wonderful time for a lot of the time, but not all of it. Uh, and we had a wonderful time, and I just count my blessings for every single day that I worked down in Kigezi High School in Uganda. It was fantastic. I would encourage any of you to go and spend a year or, or more uh, doing a project like that. <coughs> but it wasn't all easy. Um, first of all, <coughs> um, there wasn't actually any running water uh, in the school. Um, so that caused challenges of its own. It means everything takes longer, cooking, everything else. There was no electricity. Or actually there was, all the, all the buildings had fitments for electricity, but electricity only worked when the dam worked, and that was about once every four weeks. So imagine trying to do homework when you're trying to get all the borders together and you're doing it with hurricane lamps and so on. You have to get them all together. You have to do the homework. You have to supervise it as a teacher. That's pretty long hours. Um, there were other difficulties, textbooks. So the classes were quite big. My biggest class was uh, English language um, for roughly speaking 14, 15 year olds and I had a class of 60 children in the class for the year. How many textbooks did I have for 60 children to share between them? Seven. It's quite hard. No iPads, no phones, no whiteboards, seven textbooks for 60 children. And that was probably the worst ratio that I had. Um, some of the other classes uh, weren't so bad. Uh, and then there were other problems. So there was a civil war on. Uh, and that caused uh, a certain amount of tension, it caused uh, security risks. There were massacres going on uh, further north. And then people were starting to talk about this strange disease which they called SLIM, which now we know is AIDS. Um, and one of the boys died. And we then had, um, I was sharing a house with, uh, with a family and, and the wife was a nurse. And she brought back a little baby who was an orphan from the clinic and the baby was on the drip. And the baby died. And you think, this isn't a level playing field. This educational system isn't the same as the educational system that I grew up with, my 20 years investment in education. And of course, for a lot of those kids, they get hauled out of school because their families would need them to go and work on the land. So actually, when you look at, looked at my, um, my top class, who were people who uh, in this country would be 18 or, or maximum 19, I was, um, I was 21 at the time. Most of the pupils there were older than me they were certainly a lot bigger than me. So here's the school. Um, you may see a rather hairy, scruffy person in the front row. Um, I, I've lost a bit of the hair at both ends. <coughs> uh, when I decided to become a lawyer, the beard, the beard went. Um, but that's, that's one of my favorite classes. Uh, this, this is the school canteen. Um, food was very, very predictable. So breakfast was maize meal. Lunch was maize meal and rice and supper was maize meal, rice and beans for a year. <laughs> Except 
Except once a term, we got a chicken from the World Food Programme, and every now and again the school farm grew some tomatoes, and we had tomatoes. So actually it was a very safe diet, very, very uh, predictable. Uh, and there's me, and no knives and forks at that stage uh, in the school, having, having lunch. So it was a phenomenally amazing experience for me, but also uh, quite challenging. Now, of course, that was a long time ago. I left in 1984, and things have improved hugely in the years since then. Well, first of all, free education was introduced for all children. When I was there, you had to pay. If you couldn't afford the fees, you couldn't go to school. You had to drop out. So now it's free, free primary education since 1997. Then we had the Millennium Development Goals in 2000 with a huge focus on education. And in fact, the number of children out of school went down from about 100 million children around the world in 2000 down to about 57 million. Uh, by 2015, which was a phenomenal result. Of course, it's still 57 million children too many. But one of the problems is that you could get these children into school, you might not keep them when they're there. And dropout rates have been stubbornly high. It's really, really difficult to address this. The families still need the labor <coughs> from those children. So um, in this part of the world, two thirds of children drop out of primary school. So by the time someone here is 13, they will have had more education than two-thirds of those children are ever going to get in their lives. So the question is, what can we do about it? Well, that was a country going through a, a civil war. It's now emerged from the civil war. It's much more stable. But there are other countries where the position is even worse. This, by the way, is, is a picture now of the children at Kikiji High School. I got it on Facebook, and I got quite nostalgic about, uh, about seeing it. But here is uh, Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. It's actually now one of the biggest cities in Jordan. Um, education for Syrian children right now is not that promising. Inside Syria itself, probably, nobody knows exactly, but probably more than two million children are not in full-time education who should be. And outside Syria, probably about half of the refugee children are outside school. And what we had to do in Zatari, as, as many <coughs> tens of thousands of children were arriving, is set up schools for them really, really quickly. In fact, we set up mega schools. So each school has 5,000 children in it. And those are start-up educational institutions. Uh, and a lot of the children aren't yet in schools. So when the camp started, it was, it was calculated that less than 10% of children were getting an education. So you fled from a war zone, you're a refugee, you can't get into school. It's, it's not a great start. So what can we as lawyers do? I passionately believe that lawyers can make a difference in this area. And I'd like to suggest that there are three specific ways in which each of us can make a difference, wherever we are in our legal profession. And by the way, we might be uh, a qualified lawyer, we might be a trainee, we might not be going through the, the professional route, we might be um, doing a support service with a law firm. All of us uh, can make a difference, all of us can contribute. So three things. The first is infrastructure. Now, we have a, a phrase in English, some of you will know it, the three R's, which uh, grammatically speaking are reading, writing, and arithmetic, and those are the three things that all education is supposed to be, be about. But I would suggest that for us to think about how to solve education, we need to think about three T's. What are the three T's? Well, the first two are easy, teachers and textbooks. Or maybe if we're getting very 2016, then it's telephones or tablets or something not beginning with T. <laughs> um, but for, for these, these kids in Africa, it's about textbooks. <coughs> so teachers and textbooks you need, but there's a third one which is a bit less intuitive, and that's toilets. Why do you need toilets? Well, for that, we have to go to Kenya. We go, have to go to a school called Jaombi, which is a foundation school in the huge informal settlement outside Nairobi. I don't know if you've seen pictures of these informal settlements. Absolutely massive. The rains come down, it's very muddy, stuff is sloshing about everywhere, and until recently, the toilets were rudimentary in the extreme. And so for kids to go to those toilets, they could pick up diseases there. They might get stomach ache. If they're really unlucky, they'll get diarrhea, and if things are really, really bad, they'll get cholera. So what can you do about it? Well, you put in new kinds of toilets. And there is amazing, I could talk for days about toilets and toilet technology. This is really simple. This is as basic as it gets. You don't have water, you have sawdust. 
and you'll see there's, there's two compartments. I, I, won't, I won't go into detail. Um, <laughs> safe to say that what you then do is you then take the outputs and you use them to make money. And you can turn them into fertilizer. You can uh, turn them into bioenergy. You can make marketable produce. In the best one of these toilets, they actually produce electricity as well, which gives lighting, um, which means it's much safer for the kids to go to. Uh, and what's happened in, uh, in Jaombi, since they've introduced these toilets, they're called Fresh Life Toilets, since they've introduced them, the number of girls actually turning up for school has gone up by more than 50%. So teachers, textbooks, toilets. Um, what else does it take apart from the infrastructure? Well, that's lawyers come in more. So to get the infrastructure, you need money, but you need something else as well. You need legal rights. You need legally enforceable rights. You need a right to education. For the toilets, there's a right to water and sanitation. There's a right to an identity. So for a lot of kids in the world, they don't have a birth certificate. They don't have a passport. They don't have a legal identity. And without a legal identity, they are going to be disadvantaged from the beginning in accessing all services, including education. One of the things that lawyers can do about this, and have done incredibly successfully in countries ranging from India to Nepal to South Africa to Latin America, is use the courts to litigate some of these rights. It's not easy. These are socioeconomic rights. They are hard to litigate, but they can be litigated. And one of the most successful cases was in the Indian Supreme Court in 2002, which actually led to a constitutional change which actually introduced uh, new legislation. Uh, and that new legislation has been incredibly successful. For example, it said that you're entitled to education in your mother tongue. It prohibited discrimination between people uh, on the grounds of, of caste, for example. It's been very successful, and in 2010, new legislation came into effect. It's worked really well, but it's not perfect. There's still a need for lawyers to do things. Uh, this slide, which we won't go into detail, shows you the disadvantage or the comparative disadvantage that some sectors of the population in India face when accessing education. And the people who are disadvantaged are women, Dalits, Adivasis and Muslims. And actually, if you look in India at the kids who are out of school, who should be in school, three quarters of them are either Dalit or Adivasi or Muslim. So there's still a need for legal action to try and address those things. Or if you take the, uh, the birth registration question, the lack of an identity. So in another country in Asia, a study has been done which says, actually, you don't need a passport or a birth certificate or an identity card to have the right to sit in a classroom. So you can get into the school. You can have your, your seat in the class. But without that birth registration, without Without that identity, without that legal right, you can't get access to government grants. You might not be able to get any textbooks. You might not be able to get a school uniform. You might not be allowed to take exams in the school. And you certainly won't be allowed into tertiary education. So there's still a role for lawyers in looking at these rights to help enforce those rights. Now, we can't all be trial advocates. We can't all do public interest litigation. Although law firms, like yours, have actually been successfully involved in supporting this kind of litigation in different countries of the world. But there are things that we can do, even from our desks. And one of the things that we're doing is we're developing a website. This is the module on land rights. I'll just show you a few pictures. And this is a website which is going to be in English, French, and Spanish, which we're developing at the moment. And it operates by providing links to all the other content that we've been able to track across the world in enabling communities to protect their rights. So there's legal resources up there. There's a, a kind of skeleton how to go about uh, establishing your claim. Um, what are the uses of the land? How to protect land? Specific issues for people like indigenous, uh, indigenous groups uh, who are particularly discriminated against. So the issue for lawyers isn't necessarily that we're going to be the front end people. We're not necessarily going to be the first people off the plane when there's a, there's a problem. But there's a lot of backroom stuff that we can do to help and that we need to do to help. So that's my first one. The second one is about funding for education. 
Now, funding for education is clearly a massively complicated and difficult problem when budgets are stretched. So according to UNESCO, between 2008 and 2012, in the wake of the financial crisis, over half of the developing countries actually reduced their budgets for education. So money is, is a real problem. However, again, I think that there are issues for lawyers to address. And the thing that I find most heartbreaking about education in the world is when there's actually money which is earmarked for education or should be available for education but isn't getting there. And that's one of the areas I think we can help with. And I see this, this money problem as, uh, as exhibiting itself for lawyers in two ways. One is a kind of macroeconomic and one is a, is a micro and what we can do in individual cases. So to give you an example of the, of the macroeconomics, you may have heard that in London uh, just recently there was an anti-corruption summit. And before the summit, 300 leading economists wrote a letter, including uh, a lot of household name uh, economists, saying there's $170 billion which is being diverted away from the taxpayer, tax dodging. That's $170 billion that could be used, clearly not all of it, but could be used for essential services like health, like education. So on a macroeconomic level, there's 300 economists who are speaking out. So my question to you is, where's the 300 lawyers? Why aren't lawyers doing anything about it? Why aren't we speaking up? Is it because there aren't 300 famous lawyers? <laughs> is it because we don't know? Or is it we haven't thought of it yet? If the top 300 lawyers in the world put their name to a letter like that before an international conference, people would listen. They might ignore them, of course. <laughs> We're only lawyers, but people would listen. So that's the macro. What about the micro? Well, let me, let me give you an example, another example from Uganda. It's a very a uh, well-known study was published recently. And what they did is they went along to the uh, central government, to the Ministry of Education, and they said to the Ministry of Education, how much money from your budget gets spent in schools? And in particular, they were looking at secondary schools. And they did the maths, and they looked at the whole list of schools, and they worked out the exact amount of money that was going to go to each secondary school in the country. Good. Then they went to each secondary school in the country. And they said, how much money have you received from central government? And they did the maths. Guess how much of the money from central government that central government sent got to the schools? 20%. So what they then did about it is the government took it very seriously, and they were appalled. And a lot of people were appalled. And there was a campaign, a major campaign in the newspapers. And the government got really involved behind this. And it sent posters to all the schools. And it said to people, monitor your budget. Challenge the head teacher, challenge the administration. And when they came back and did the study later on, they found instead of only 20% of the money was getting there, over 90% of the money was getting there. So one intervention had an amazing effect. Paul Collier's written about this story in his book, The Bottom Billion. <coughs> it's never as simple <laughs> As a, as, a, as a short story lays out. There's a lot of reasons why that happened and there's a lot of reasons why more resources did go into education. It wasn't just the transparency. But for me, the story is about how do we do that transparency? We're lawyers. We know about transparency. We know about right to information. We've got freedom of information laws. We can press for freedom of information laws. We've got criminal laws. We can prosecute corruption. What are we doing about it as lawyers? on a micro level. So that's the second way. <coughs> uh, and then there's a third way that I think that lawyers uh, can get involved. And, and this is my final way, and I'm drawing to a close. And that is going back to the libraries uh, and to the lawyers um, uh, and to kids like Mary. So um, we're lawyers, and we've had um, a good education. And there's actually quite a lot of lawyers out there in the world. Another study showed that from uh, 1970 to 2010, over therefore a 40-year uh, period, the world's population went up from 3.7 billion to 6.9 billion. So not double, but you know, getting on for it. What about the lawyers in the same period? Did it double? No, we beat them. <laughs> the number of lawyers went up more than four times in the same period. 
that the population didn't quite double. It went up from 1.1 million lawyers in the world to over 5 million <coughs> lawyers in the world. Now, of course, we can all agree that lawyers are a good thing. Some people sometimes think that you can have too much of a good thing. <laughs> uh, and if you look at the number of lawyers in different countries and the path to education for lawyers, how we become lawyers, you see some quite startling discrepancies. So, for example, the Bahamas. Been in the news recently? The Bahamas has more lawyers in it than Malawi, which has a population of 16 million people. Or you take a state like Nebraska. Nebraska has more lawyers in it than six big countries in Africa combined. So in West Africa, where we've had the Ebola crisis, you take Sierra Leone, you take Liberia, you take the neighboring Central African Republic, and then add to those uh, Malawi, uh, add in uh, Eritrea, add in some very small countries, and you find that Nebraska has got more lawyers than all those countries put together. So what can we do about it? Should we do anything about it? Well, I, th I think we can. I don't think it's easy, um, but I think there are some quick wins and I think there's some slow wins and we probably need a combination. So this is one of the main reasons why we founded Lawyers Against Poverty. We think that lawyers who are in countries where there's a lot of lawyers, where we've had a big investment in our education, can help the development of other lawyers in other countries. That's why I had the meeting that I referred to with, with Rachel with her heavy textbook that got me into the libraries in the first place. So we were looking at can we link lawyers in this country, can we twin them with lawyers in other countries? Could we take a law firm like yours and actually link the law firm with a university in a developing country? Could we maybe even send someone to be an academic? I think maybe someone who's two, three, four years qualified, ideally with good academic credentials, maybe even a master's or a doctorate, and actually put them into a university in a developing country for two years. It's, it's not very expensive. I mean, I've done a rough calculation for your law firm and I've worked out that it would cost less than $10 per employee to send someone like that for a year. Um, and that would make a transformative impact on that university. And the reason I know that is because I've visited a lot of these law schools. I've been to see what the teaching is like and I've talked to lawyers who are teaching in these universities. And I know what teaching is like here. And I've done a program like this myself. I spent three years uh, just after the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe on a funded scheme teaching law <coughs> in a university. And we were teaching from eight in the morning to late in the evening. And the students absolutely loved it. And the insights they got into different ways of learning and different forms of teaching were fantastic. And I keep in touch with my old pupils. I left there over 20 years ago. One of them is, is the head of the Polish delegation to the uh, Council of uh, Bars and Law Societies in Europe. Another is a general council of, of one of the big companies, some of them in government. Now, these people were hugely impacted by a relatively short stint of interesting education linking up with a lawyer from another country, telling them about the law in his country, and actually introducing different teaching methods. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a massive ask. So, if we think back over all the different things that we can do, we'll see that some of them are really, really simple things to do, you know, linking up with a lawyer in another country. A student in this country who's got all the benefits of a library with 11 million books, linking up with a student in another country who's got 15 books published over the last 15 years. Can that student help each other? There's one country in southern Africa where um, at the end of their law degree and their professional exams, 200 students sat for their law exams their professional exams. Do you know how many passed? Six out of 200. And six passed on the retakes. Why? Well, lots of reasons why students fail exams. <laughs> As we know, we've probably failed a few in our time. But one of the reasons is they didn't have that individual support. They didn't have access to those advantages we've got. We can give them that. We can link students here taking exams with students in another country taking exams. We can link those institutions. I was absolutely delighted this morning when I got an email from, uh, from a friend of mine who said a consignment of 40 boxes of books from law firms in London has just arrived in a university in Gambia. Wow. So whether we're talking about a school in Uganda, like the school I taught in, 
or a university or a parliament, like the Parliament of India passing new legislation, there's all things we can do. And I'd just like to leave you with the thought, what investment have you had in your education and what can you give back for education of other people? Thank you.